our Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is basically uninhabitable. Food is scarce. Everyone has faced the reality that death is coming to everyone very soon. It cannot be avoided. You are the only Christian in this group. What one message would you want to get across to this group of people? They're open to hearing from the Bible but you have only one chapter available to you. Which one would it be? Now, you have nearly 1,200 to choose from, exactly 1,189 chapters in the Bible to choose from. Let me narrow it down to 929 for you. You can only choose from the Old Testament. Where are you going to go? On an island, handful of lost people, you're all dying. You have one message in one chapter to communicate with them. Where are you going to go? Without any second thoughts, I would tell you, you should go to Isaiah 53. This is a chapter that we often turn to before, during, or after we remember Christ on the cross during the Lord's Supper. If you'll go ahead and turn there now, we'll begin reading actually in chapter 52 at verse 13. Isaiah's thoughts begin there and run through the end of chapter 53. Chapter breaks are good and helpful and verses are helpful, but I hope you remember that they're not inspired. And this is one of those places where this is a stupid chapter break. It doesn't work. It's terrible. There shouldn't be a chapter break here. Before we read it, let me say this. I think we all agree with Paul that all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for training in righteousness, for reproof, for correction. But isn't it true that we come to some portions of Scripture and they are more weighty, they are more solemn, they are more forceful, they are more consequential, they point more directly to the person of Christ. Some scriptures delve deeper into the overall message of the Bible. This is one of those passages. And I don't mind telling you that I generally have a sense of inadequacy anytime I teach the Bible. But when I come to a passage like this, when I come to Isaiah 53, I am overwhelmed with my own inadequacy. It has been called the Mount Everest of Messianic prophecy. I don't know how high we'll climb today, but maybe we'll at least get a view of it from afar. In fact, I'll ask you, would you mind standing? And let's read this monumental passage together, beginning at Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings were 
will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was pierced for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. You can be seated. Well, the book of Isaiah the book that we know as the book of Isaiah, bears the name of its author, the prophet Isaiah. He wrote primarily to the southern kingdom. By this time, that would be Judah. By this time in history, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, have divided into two separate nations. The northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. Israel had basically turned completely from God and was in Assyrian control. And Judah seems to be headed in the same direction as the spiritual conditions steadily decline. Now, what's the theme of Isaiah? Now, your first thought might be judgment. He's an Old Testament prophet, right? That's all those guys do is wave their bony finger. God's coming with wrath, fire and brimstone. Well, of course, there is judgment. There is wrath coming. He is an Old Testament prophet, and those guys' job was to warn. But it's more than that. His primary message actually is that of redemption. That may surprise you if you've not read the book of Isaiah, if you don't know the book of Isaiah. This book has been called The Gospel According to Isaiah. Augustine called it the fifth gospel. Some have said, no, it's not the fifth gospel. It's the first gospel. Isaiah himself has been called an Old Testament evangelist. He's been called an evangelical prophet. He's been called the St. Paul 
of the Old Testament. The name Isaiah means the Lord or Jehovah is salvation, which is, in fact, the theme of the book. The Lord is salvation. Isaiah says more about the person and the work of Jesus Christ than any other book in the Old Testament. Isaiah is the most Old Testament book quoted in the New Testament at least 65 times. Some, in fact, have said it's alluded to and quoted as many as 85 times. i give you a little information on the book of Isaiah that may be trivia, it may not be, but it is very interesting. How many books are in the Bible? 66. How many chapters are in Isaiah? 66. Everyone, or most everyone, agree that Isaiah splits two different distinct sections between 39 and 40. 1 through 39 is one section. 40 through 66 is another section. The first 39 chapters mark the first section. The last 27 chapters mark the second section. How many books in the Old Testament? 39. How many books in the New Testament? 27. Coincidence? Maybe. Interesting? Very interesting. Now let me say this. Careful with number analogies of any kind. We don't have secret codes in the Bible. But this is very interesting. Think about this. What is the emphasis of the Old Testament? God's righteousness. God's holiness, God's judgment against sin. Guess what the emphasis in chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah are? God's righteousness, God's justice, His judgment against sin. What's the emphasis in the New Testament? Grace, salvation. So it is with Isaiah 40 through 66. Grace, salvation. Chapter 39 ends with a warning to Judah, you are going into Babylonian captivity if you don't repent. Chapter 40 opens like this, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says God. Now it gets even more intriguing. I want you to see this. Flip to chapter 40 with me and listen to verses 3 through 5. Whoops, that is not what I wanted. Give me just a moment to see if I can recoup from that. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I'm so sorry. That is what I want. Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. I was looking at the wrong, wrong verse. Verse 3. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, go to the New Testament. In your mind, who opens up the New Testament, paving the way for the Lord? A voice crying in the wilderness. Who would that be? John the Baptist opens the ministry of the New Testament with Christ. Now, one more. Flip to the end of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 22. says this, and this is, this is right at the end. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, 
so shall your offspring and your name endure. That's how the book ends. New heavens, new earth. How does the New Testament end? Revelation 21, 22. A new heaven and a new earth. So aside from the coolness of the numbers, which I think is pretty cool, we have in the book of Isaiah a miniature Bible. And and get this, I'm not done yet. Literally, in the middle of the second half, in the middle of those 27 chapters, guess what we have? Isaiah 53 with its message, comfort, yes, comfort, my people. D.L. Moody once said, a condensed Bible is in this chapter, speaking of Isaiah 53. This portion of Scripture is also known as the song of the suffering servant, perhaps because Isaiah wrote in typical Hebrew poetic fashion. This is actually the last of four servant songs in his book. They are in chapters 42, 49, 50, and then in 52 and 53 where we are. Each one of those chapters, each one of those servant songs refers to a servant. The word is slave, eved, slave. I'll give you a sample description from each one of these songs of the servant of this slave 42 1 which is the first servant song behold my servant whom i uphold my chosen one in whom my soul delights i have put my spirit upon him he will bring forth justice to the nations any of that sound familiar to you maybe it will after i read matthew three seventeen. a voice came out of the heavens This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. The next servant song, 49, verse 1. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. When was Joseph told to name the baby in Mary's womb? When the baby was in her womb, what did the angel say to Joseph? You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. What does the name Jesus, what does the word Jesus mean? Jehovah is salvation. The third song, I gave my back to those who strike me. And my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Who might this be? Isn't it obvious? Matthew 26, 67. They spat in his face. Beat him with their fist. And others slapped him. Now, the suffering only intensifies in the fourth servant song in chapter 53. Just scan it with me. Verse 3. Despised, forsaken of men, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Look at verse 4. Stricken. Smitten of God, afflicted. Verse 5, pierced through, crushed, scourged. Verse 7, oppressed, afflicted. Verse 8, we see the word oppression again. And that's a different Hebrew word. The first word oppressed in verse 7 is the idea of pressure. This word oppression here is the idea of restraint. In fact, literally, it reads, from prison he was stricken. Verse 8, also we see judgment. This is, both of these, oppression and judgment, are legal terms. This refers to the act of deciding a legal case. Jesus had some legal cases that he had decided against him, didn't he? 
Do you know how many? Do you know how many he had decided against him? Six. There were two trials. There was a religious trial with three phases. There was a civil trial with three phases. First, it was the Jewish trial. In the middle of the night, Jesus has been betrayed, been arrested, hauled to the house of Annas, the former high priest, Jewish high priest. But he still had power. He still had influence. Annas sent Jesus to his son-in-law's house, who was nothing more than a puppet. He was the sitting high priest. He was just a puppet of his father-in-law. Their houses probably were connected, only separated by an outdoor courtyard, which is probably the courtyard that Peter was warming himself by a fire in when he denied the Lord. Jesus goes to Annas. Annas sends him to Caiaphas, who basically is the kind of guy who says, what do you want me to do, Daddy? Caiaphas quickly gathers the Sanhedrin together in his house, charging Jesus with blasphemy. This is still in the middle of the night, the wee hours of the morning. By daylight, the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas meet again for a fake trial, which resulted in a death penalty. Now they need a civil court. They can't pronounce a death penalty. They, can't, they can pronounce it. They can't enact this death penalty. They need Rome. They need a civil case for Christ. So they send him to Pilate. Pilate wants nothing to do with him. He questions him. He realizes Jesus is a political hot button. When he finds out he's a Galilean, he gladly sends him to Herod. Herod toys with him, plays with him, mocks him, puts a purple robe on him to mock his claim to be the king of the Jews and sends him back to Pilate. Pilate at this point, hoping to placate the bloodthirsty crowd, has him scourged, which is basically strapping him to a pole with his hands up like this while two lictors, two Roman soldiers armed with leather whips with the ends embedded with metal and bones beat his back diagonally. In fact, they would take turns. They, they would, there were other lictors in line to spell the men who got tired of the beating. These beatings would lacerate the victim's back, exposing nerves, muscles, bones, sometimes organs. In fact, these scourgings sometimes resulted in death. That doesn't seem to be Pilate's intention here. He doesn't want to kill him. It seems that he wants to generate some sympathy from the crowd. So he beats Jesus. He has him beat. He brings him back before the crowd. There is a, a Jewish custom on Passover that allows, would allow Pilate to release one criminal. So as you know, Pilate says, here's Barabbas, here's Jesus. You want me to let Barabbas go or Jesus go? And the crowd, as you know, cried, crucify him, crucify him. Basically becoming another trial, if you will. So we have three religious guilties, three civil innocents. Remember, Pilate never found any guilt in Christ. Herod never found guilt in Christ. But it was Pilate who caved to the mob, washing his hands in front of the crowd. I find no guilt in this man. I wash my hands. His blood be on you, as they cried out, crucify him. To make matters worse, most all of this was illegal. Two trials, six phases in 12 hours. Now go back to Isaiah 53.8. 
we continue looking at the progressive nature of his suffering, oppression, judgment, we pick it up, cut off from the land of the living, verse 8 also says. Verse 10, put him to grief. Verse 11, anguish of his soul. Who is this servant? Who is this servant who suffered so? It's Jesus, right? Well, there's a scene in Acts 8 that confirms this for us. Philip is preaching. Philip being one of the helpers chosen in Acts 6. He's preaching. The Holy Spirit says, go here. Go down the Gaza Road. He meets up with an Ethiopian eunuch who was a political diplomat. He's in his chariot. He's reading a scroll. Guess what he's reading? Isaiah. In particular, he's reading Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. We pick up the story in verse 34. Philip has already asked the eunuch, Do you know what you're reading? And he says, How could I know unless someone tells me? So then in verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? And that's actually a fair question. Because throughout Isaiah's book, sometimes he uses the word servant for himself. Sometimes he uses the word servant for Israel as a nation. Sometimes he uses the word for Christ. Sometimes he sort of combines Israel and Christ. So it's a fair question. Philip, again, prepared, had already asked him, verse 35, and this is great, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, what scripture? Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. Is there anything else to preach? Isn't this what Jesus did in Luke 24, 27? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, wouldn't that include Isaiah 53? He explained the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. If there is ever a Bible study that I wish I was at, it was that one. Can you imagine Christ himself Taking you through the Old Testament. This is me. This is me. This is me. This is talking about me. I fulfilled that. I fulfilled that. I will do that. I will do this. Absolutely mind-boggling. Well, let's see if we can look just a little deeper into what Isaiah has to say about the servant. We won't climb very high. We'll just, we'll just look from afar. His servant song can be divided up into five stanzas of three verses each. That's the best way to look at it. The first one, chapter 52, 13 through 15, this is, we'll call, or we'll say, God's servant will be exalted. God's servant will be exalted. I'll just go ahead and give you all five of the stanzas now. The second one, chapter 53, verses 1 through 3, God's servant will be rejected. Verses 4 through 6, God's servant will be punished. Verses 7 through 9, God's servant will be sacrificed. And then verses 10 through 12, God's servant will be glorified. Now this song is like a sandwich. Do you see the two pieces of bread? Exaltation, glorification. The top piece is the exaltation. Behold, my servant will prosper. Or a better translation actually would be, my servant will act wisely. My servant will prosper. Behold, my servant will act wisely, I should say. 
He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. There are two other times that Isaiah uses this same kind of language, high and lifted up. The first is in Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. The other usage, Isaiah 57, 15, For thus says the Lord, the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So in 52.13, it's high and lifted up. In 6.1, it's lofty and exalted. 57.15, it's high and exalted. More importantly, it's the same two Hebrew verbs in all three verses. Specifically, in 52.13, it's as if Isaiah is climbing the ladder of ascendancy with Christ. He is high, higher, highest. He is high. He is lifted up higher. He is greatly exalted highest. He's put him on the same plane as God the Father, Jehovah, Yahweh. God the Son who came down and stooped as low as he could possibly stoop, Paul tells us in Philippians, will again assume the highest position in heaven. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus How many knees will bow? Every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9-11. But before this exaltation, before this top piece of bread, before the bottom piece of bread, there's some suffering that has to take place. Devastating humiliation. In fact, beyond recognition. Think back to the cross. Think back to those few hours before Christ was nailed to the cross. His onlookers looked on. What they saw was appalling jaw-dropping. He had gone through agonizing prayer in Gethsemane that brought him to the point of his sweat becoming blood. He'd been betrayed, arrested, 12 hours of these marathon trials, beatings, whippings, scourging, ripping his back open, crown of thorns pressed on his head, piercing his head. He looked more like a defeated MMA fighter than a Messiah at this point. People would look at him, this is no Messiah. This is no king. He can't even save himself. But the day will come, Isaiah says, when kings won't have a word to say, but they will stand or fall in awe of him. He will be exalted. And just as Isaiah gives us this glorious picture of his exaltation, he he comes crashing back down. In verse 14, just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons 
of men. He won't be much to look at. He will be beaten beyond recognition to a pulp, Isaiah prophesies. Jesus knew this. He taught this. He said again, Luke 24, verse 26, Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? God's servant will be exalted. God's servant will be rejected. We see that in verses 1 through 3. Despised, forsaken of men. Men hid their face from Him. Did not esteem Him. Even before the beatings, Jesus wasn't much to look at. I don't think we could have picked him out of a crowd of ordinary Jews. I don't think if we'd have seen him in a crowd that we could have said, that's Jesus. He just blended in. He just looked like every other typical Jewish man. No stately form, no majesty, no magnetic looks about him. To the Jewish mind, he was actually nothing more than a sucker branch, an unwanted, unneeded sucker branch. You know what sucker branches are, don't you? If you have some crepe myrtles at home, maybe, you trim those things up, you, you clean them up, and you got a nice-looking trunk with leaves on the top. You go back three days later, and you have these annoying little sucker branches all over it. Olive trees in the area were known for that. Sweet gum trees, if you know what a sweet gum tree is, those annoying gumball trees, you may call them, that drop the little spiky gumballs everywhere. I don't know if you've ever noticed, you cannot kill that tree. You cut it down, it sprouts back from the stump, it sprouts back from the root 40 feet from the stump for years. Who needs it? Who wants it? Get it out of here. That's how they looked at Jesus. He's just an unwanted sucker branch. He came from parched, dry ground. He didn't come from the right place. He didn't come from the right people. He didn't have the pedigree. He didn't fit the mold for the Messiah. He didn't come from the right side of town. He's unimpressive. In fact, he's the kind of person that you would have just as soon avoid. Why do modern-day Jews... Reject Jesus. It's, it's so clear. Isaiah 53 speaks of Christ. It's crystal clear. Why do they reject Him? Well, many Jews don't even know that Isaiah 53 exists, in fact. Oh, they have it in their Hebrew Bibles. But like some professing Christians, which wouldn't be you, I know, they don't ever pick them up and read them. They perhaps go to synagogue every week. They listen to the rabbis read. The rabbi will never read Isaiah 53. He'll read portions of Isaiah. He'll stop. They go through a circular uh, schedule every year. They read the same thing every year. Isaiah 53 is never read in the synagogue. In fact, it's been called the forbidden chapter. I saw a YouTube video of a Messianic Jew, which is a, a Jew who's come to Christ, in Israel, in Jerusalem, I believe, going around with a mic, asking people about Isaiah 53. And, and, and handing them a Bible, a Hebrew Bible, and having them to read it. They had no clue. They were stunned. They, they were, when they finished, they, they were somber and sober and didn't know what to say. It blew them away. They were absolutely shocked. But more than that, modern rabbis will tell you, well, the Jews don't accept Jesus because we can't embrace a trinity. We, we can't embrace a God-man. God doesn't become man. God doesn't put on flesh. They can't accept that. They will also tell you that we can't accept Jesus as a Messiah 
He failed. He died. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. His, his mission was a failure. You know what I say to that? Both of those two things? Hogwash. That's not why they reject Jesus. They reject Jesus for the same reason that every other person who rejects Jesus rejects Him. They don't need Him. They don't need a Savior. They don't need righteousness from Him. They have enough righteousness of their own. They grade themselves on the curve. Sure, I do some bad, but I do some good. The good's going to outweigh the bad. God's going to see the good. The judgment day, overlook the bad. The Jew is no different than anyone else. In fact, Paul points this out, Romans 10, 3. Speaking of the Jewish people, he says, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They're just doing what everyone else does. You realize there's only two religions in the world, don't you? Just two. The right one and the wrong one. Or the one that says do. Or the one that says done. Judaism had become not designed by God this way. Judaism had become nothing more than a religion of do, 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 do. Versus God's true religion. Done. And trust me. There is coming a day when the Jews as a collective people will come to saving faith in Christ. Large, large, large numbers of Jews will come to faith and repentance in Christ. Verses 4 through 6 might very well be the confession in their mouth when they come to Christ. Verse 4, Surely, without a doubt, absolutely, certainly, they will say, He bore our sins. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on Him. By His scourging, we are healed. The Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. The $5 theological term for this, or maybe it's a $20 theological term, is penal substitutionary atonement. These people will come to their senses you know what it's like to come to your senses? You've been, you've been confused, thought you knew what was right, in whatever area, just in general, and all of a sudden the truth comes to you and you go, wow, now I see it. In a much deeper sense, these Jews come to their senses spiritually and they say, I thought he, I thought he was a blasphemer. I thought he was a sinner. I thought he died for his own sins. No, it was mine that he died for. It was my iniquities. It was my transgressions that he died for. We thought he got what he deserved. A 12th century Jewish scholar said that very thing. Jesus deserved the violent death he suffered. But, verse 5, but he... We were wrong. We were blind. We were deaf to the truth. It wasn't his sins that was the cause of his death. It was mine. Ours. In some ways, this is, 4 through 6, is in some way, is a lament. It's, it's these, these Jews who will come to saving faith 
looking back and perhaps thinking about those who missed it, who didn't get it before it was too late. Verse 6 is the theme of chapter 53. It lays out the problem, man's problem, and it lays out the solution, God's solution. The problem, we all like sheep have gone astray, turned to his own way. The solution, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Why are we compared to sheep? Sheep do what they do because of their nature. Sheep wander off because of their nature. You sin because of your nature. You sin because you are a sinner. Christ, the most innocent man who ever lived, got punished as if he were the most vile sinner. Who ever lived? You. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. Every repentant sinner must have a similar confession to this confession in verses 4 through 6. I thought you were a myth, I didn't think you were real. I thought a bunch of religious fanatics made you up. I thought you were just a man. I thought you were unimportant. I thought you were my genie in a bottle. I thought you would just be there when I needed you and give me whatever wonderful little trinkets and toys and gifts I needed for life. I thought I was a pretty good person deserving a pass. I thought I deserved forgiveness. No, no, no. Now I recognize my very nature to the core of who I am is corrupt and I deserve hell. And now I recognize what's been done on my behalf. God's servant was punished for sinners. The fourth stanza. God's servant was sacrificed. That's in verses 7 through 9. He was a willing sacrifice. Sheep go to the shearer the same way they go to slaughter. No resistance. Jesus had no kicking, no screaming, no self-defense. He stood in those 12 hours of trials and beatings. He never defended himself. Never. Silence and submission, just like a lamb led to slaughter. To Pilate, you remember he said, you'd have no power over me if it were not given to you by my Father. Complete submission to the Father Christ had. He sacrificed himself, Isaiah says, being cut off from the land of the living. What is this? Death. Death. For the sins of others. He didn't die for his own sins. He had none. Don't miss this fascinating little piece of prophetic information in, in verse 9. Revolving, involving his, his burial. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Jesus was seen as a common criminal, a crucified common criminal, two thugs on either side of him. When they died, they were to be thrown into a common pit, into a common grave like you would throw a bag of garbage into a dumpster or into a landfill. But what happened with Jesus? Where was he buried? In the tomb of a rich man. Joseph of Arimathea showed up. Pilate, I want his body. Takes his body down, puts it in his very own tomb. Precise prophecy 
isn't it? Finally, the fifth stanza, God's servant will be glorified. And this is the bottom piece of the bread. Exaltation, glorification, sandwiched in between is all the suffering. Notice verse 10. Who is it that's pleased with all that's been described? Who is pleased here? God the Father. Why? Is God some kind of supernatural sadist? Someone who enjoys inflicting pain for the sake of inflicting pain? No. This pleased the Father because His plan came to fruition. This pleased the Father because His Son was most glorified. A few weeks ago, we talked about this very thing. Christ came to this earth because God wanted to give Him a gift of redeemed sinners. Here is the church, son, if I could say that without being irreverent. Go get them, but you have to die for them. You have to sacrifice yourself for them. That doesn't seem like a very good gift, does it? Think it through. What most glorifies Christ? Redeeming a people for Himself. Your salvation, my salvation, was all about the glory of Christ and the love between God the Father and God the Son. Does God love you? Absolutely He loves you. But don't ever forget who He loves more. He loves His Son more than you. That's why He will glorify Him. He has glorified Him. He will glorify Him. Look at the proof that this pleased the Father. Verse 10, He says He will see His offspring, prolong His days. Verse 11, He says He will be satisfied. Verse 12, He says, I will allot Him a portion with the great. Now all of this is predicated on one thing. He must be alive. This is resurrection. This this is God's gospel. Chapter 53 is God's gospel. Christ, His servant, died for sins. Christ, His servant, was buried. Christ, His servant, was raised. Now file this away. Isaiah wrote this 700 years years before it happened yet he wrote it as if he were standing there watching it all unfold this is no ordinary book do you believe that in 1947 some shepherd boys throwing some rocks so the story goes and near the dead sea they heard a crack. They heard some pottery breaking. They go in. What do they find? Some scrolls. One of the things that they find or that others find after them is a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. They did 150 years before Christ. In intact, basically perfectly reserved. It's a 24-foot scroll. It's on display in a museum in Jerusalem now, I believe. That scroll is almost identical to the Hebrew text that was already in use, already being used to translate into English. In fact, Norman Geisler, in his uh, book, A General Introduction to the Bible, says this. Of all, excuse me, of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in question. He's referring to the Dead Sea Scrolls versus what's there or what they were using. Ten of these letters are simply a matter of spelling. This doesn't affect the sense. Four more letters are minor stylistic changes, such as conjunctions. The three remaining letters comprise the word light, which is added in verse 11. doesn't affect the meaning. Furthermore, this word is supported by the Septuagint. That's the Greek version of the Old Testament. 
Thus, in one chapter of 166 words, there is only one word, three letters that are questionable after a thousand years of transmission. And those three letters don't change the meaning of Isaiah 53. Do you believe this book? Do you believe Isaiah 53? Do you believe this suffering servant is Jesus Christ, the crucified, buried, risen Lord of the universe? Here's the ultimate question for you. Does your belief in this book, in this chapter, make you love Jesus Christ? If you ask me, to boil the Christian life down to one thing. What does it mean to be a Christian? Love Christ with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Do you? If you do, you are growing in that love. And when you come to Isaiah 53... You're like those believers on the road to Emmaus after Jesus talked to them. They got heartburn, spiritual heartburn, if you will. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart burns when you hear, no matter how many times you hear it, what He's done for you. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your amazing word. May we never get tired of it. May it never be boring to us. May the person of Christ, even more importantly, never become ho-hum. May we be continually enthralled, amazed, Take our breath away. Make our hearts burn for what you've done for sinners. Oh, Father, those who love you, those who love your Son, stir their hearts to love you more. For those who don't love you, for those who could not honestly say that they love Jesus Christ, would you do for them what you did for those Jewish believers who will confess in verses 4 through 6. It's our transgressions you bore. It's our griefs. It's our sorrows. It's our iniquities that you bore. Draw sinners to yourself that you might continue to fulfill what your Father promised. That you be glorified. I pray we'd do it today as we continue our day. Whatever we do today, may we think much of the cross, much of the resurrection, much of our great dependency, our desperation for our Lord God, for our Savior. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ who love you. Thank you for their attention to your word. Continue to teach them.